I think the year, both with the pandemic and the politics and the social unrest and the social in, you know, injustice issues are really important because they tell us what is important. They tell us having a voice is important. It tells us that being cared for and being respected is important. It tells us that being safe and above all, having the opportunity to engage others with whom you feel safe is critical. So the pandemic, especially to people of my generation who have to be very careful because of the risk factors, uh, we realize that there's only one thing of value in life and that's our relationships. So, and I think what we're learning is that success has nothing to do with wealth and accumulation. Success has everything to do with how well we are embedded or connected with others. Hey there, this is Jim Donovan. Welcome to the show. I am so glad that you're here with me today. We've got such a great show coming for you. One of my all-time science heroes is on with us. His name is Dr. Stephen Porges. We would need an entire episode just to read his credentials. He's a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University. He's the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He's also a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and a professor emeritus at both University of Illinois Chicago and the University of Maryland. He's published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers across many different disciplines. And in 1994, he proposed the polyvagal theory. Dr. Porges, welcome to the show. I am so grateful to have you here today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and thank you, Jim, for inviting me. Of course, these are unusual days in which this becomes our moment of social interaction because we can look at someone. Uh, but, you know, we're surviving, we're not ill, and we're safe, and we're, uh, in a sense, grateful for what we're, for being here. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm finding this format, so, so before the pandemic, I never even knew what to do with Zoom. It's been a godsend to be able to have just some kind of face-to-face -face interactions, like you're saying. Yeah, well, as you get older, your risk for uh, uh, the severity of COVID-19 goes up, so you have to be very careful. And you still, but you also need to feed, nourish your nervous system through social interaction. And uh, Zoom isn't, isn't perfect, but it certainly is much, much better than not being able to engage people. So welcome to my office. I've been reading your work last few years as I've been writing about uh, the vagus nerve and vagus nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen uh, in, in your bibliography, you have over 300 articles since the 70s. Uh, <laughs> we were talking before the, we hit record here, and it just it really seems like you're on a mission here. Like I'm looking back to like 1969, you yeah. know, you're, you're writing articles. Yeah. And uh, I'm really interested, like, what drives you to do so much for your field? Well, you know, some of us, I would say, are very fortunate to uh, be scientists in a time when our science was just evolving or, or being developed. And for me, my interest was in how physiological state was related to the world that we experienced. How did it affect our thought process, our behavior? And there was this new area called psychophysiology that was really emerging when I was in graduate school. I said, this is it. Mm -hmm. Because to me, the other things were kind of boring. Uh, so it was like you, you want to know when you looked at a person, what would you know if you could measure their physiology? Uh, would you know whether their bodies are reactive in a sense like a hair trigger to react? Because we have situations where we engage people with a smile and then we'll turn away for a moment. And right. that turning away will be trigger a reaction that we are dismissive to them and we've insulted them. And we've all had experiences where someone we want to shake their hands with and they just walk by us because they didn't see us, but our body interprets it as if uh, they don't like us or we're not important enough. So we, we have our narratives that seem to emerge from our physiological state. So I was interested in that and I was interested in uh, if we were able to quantify this and also then manipulate, was this going to be a portal that we could use to, in a sense, make people more accessible, more, more 
uh, accessible to social behavior, to connectedness, and even to learning. Because again, we all realize that when we're upset, we can't learn. Or if you're a performer, when you're upset, it's hard to do, hard to, in a sense, do your craft. And so the game plan was that we all have creativity and we all have this kind of generative nature. What would it be like if we also were able to this is throw out our threat responses and be calm enough to be accessible to others. What would the world be like? So if you wanna know what my mission is, my mission is really an understanding that we as humans are really quite a wonderful species. We're actually a warm, supportive, benevolent species, but only, or I said usually only, when our nervous system is not in a state of defense. So, uh, so when does it get in the state of defense? Well, when we're evaluated, because evaluation is a trigger that, of defense. And so our educational model is a defensive model. When we go to a physician's office, we get evaluated, or we get scared, we go to threat responses. When we deal with the other levels, let's say religious institutions, they're playing with threat as well. And so our whole world seems to be functioning around reactions to threat. Yet inside us, we know that inside is a core and that core wants to be open, wants to be embracing and wants to generate and connect with others. So that's my mission. What a great answer, thank you. I looked you know, through all the different things that, that you've been into and I've seen this common thread through uh, many of the years which points to this nerve that, that I write a little bit about called the vagus nerve. Yeah. And I'm just wondering in your words, if you could yeah. kind of the basics of, you know, what is the vagus nerve? How does it help us? See, I'm going to, I'm going to, that, I view that almost as a misdirection. Okay. Yeah. And the issue is when we start talking about the vagus, people think that this nerve has an intelligence, has an executive function. Yeah. And I want you to think in a different way. Think of it as a conduit, a highway, a bi-directional highway connecting our brain with our organs. Mm. And so the vagus is really the major organ, uh, major nerve of surveillance of our bodily organs. And it's a major organ of regulating those, organ, uh, regulating those organs. So it provides the neuroanatomy or the primary neuroanatomy for a brain body medicine or brain body science or brain body practices but in the more common language, we call it mind-body. So, uh, but basically what we're really saying is our mental activity can trigger brain processes that travel down to our organs. So we, can, we all realize that positive visualizations and in your world, and it's gonna be my world in a few minutes, when we listen to music, we have bodily experiences that is going through the vagus, mm. that information. So when we sing, we'll, we'll get into other aspects of it because that nerve uh, which connects our organs of our body and the one we'll talk to, two primary organs we'll talk about, one will be the heart, the other will be the gut. And with the heart, we feel the exuberance and the energy and the love and the caring. And with our gut, we feel uh, despair, we feel loss, and we feel fear. It gets below our diaphragm. And so uh, these organs are really being recruited in states of defense or states of safety. And that's going through this brain body highway called the vagus. But when we get into the area of music, it gets even more interesting because to extract uh, intonation of sounds, especially those in the range of human vocal sounds, especially female vocal which uh, you actually recruit nerves that regulate muscles in your middle ear. Now this becomes kind of an interesting world. So when you listen to a melodic or let's say a mother's lullaby, yeah. you are actually uh, utilizing nerves that regulate muscles in the middle ear. But those muscles, the nerves that regulate those muscles are, originate from an area of the brainstem that regulates our vagus, calms us down. So when we uh, listen to melodic music like a, a mother's lullaby, we calm down. And the nerves in the brainstem that regulate those middle ear muscles 
also regulate the muscles of our face, especially the muscles around the eye. And that's called the avicularis oculi. So that when you are talking or sweet talking someone, you see in the upper part of their face, they're alive or exuberance. So the notion of social connectedness and social communication involves the vagus, involves listening, involves facial expressivity, and involves the intonation of our voice because the vagus also regulates the, a laryngeal nerve that controls intonation of voice. So if our voice is melodic, like a mother uh, talking to her baby, yeah. we relax in the presence of that person. So if the voice is monotonic and low frequency, more like a bark, we tense up. If the voice is a higher pitch, narrow voice without any prosody, we interpret that immediately as anxiety or someone being scared. So our nervous system immediately understands what intonation means. And when we move to music, what do we do? We take it out of the social context, we package it, and we pump it into our body and listen so we can move our body into different physiological states through the intonation of acoustic stimuli. Well, I can't wait to get into this. This is exciting. I'm wondering, is there a way that the vagus nerve can weaken or strengthen? This, this is a good question because the terminology that is actually in my writings is something called vagal tone. tone. And to someone who is not a physiologist, they may think it's like lifting weights, the nerve gets stronger. And what the vagal tone is really measuring, it's the amount of information that is flowing from that brainstem area to your heart and regulating it. And that vagal tone uh, really provides us with resilience. And what that really means, and I'll kind of deconstruct this for you, vagal, uh, the vagus is primarily a break. It's a calming system. And the vagal pathways above the diaphragm, the most important ones go to your heart and your bronchi. And to your heart, it goes to an area called the sinal atrial node you will know it as the pacemaker of your heart. And this is an important concept to understand that for most of us, our pacemaker is firing at a rate much faster than our heart is beating, but the vagus is inhibiting that pace so that our heart rates are slower than the intrinsic rate of the heart. And this is kind of an interesting, I would say, uh, strategy. It means that we have a reserve before we need to recruit sympathetic activity, which can, is more difficult to regulate and can lead us into aggressiveness and fight flight behaviors. So the fact that we can mobilize just by taking the break off gives us tremendous resilience because we can calm down just by putting the brake back on. So this flexibility of taking on and off the vagal break is what gives us this great resilience to be a social species. Do I understand it right? If I have higher vagal tone, more information can travel on the vagus nerve? Is that more accurate? information is traveling on the vagus nerve? But I will now make it even more complex because uh, over the years I start to ask questions like, what if you have high vagal tone, but you don't efficiently use it? So, in a sense, okay. that it's not really coming on and off your pacemaker, modulating your heart rate efficiently. So, I came up with a new metric. Uh, it's called vagal efficiency. And for those people who are listening who have some, I would say, uh, symptoms that are linked into, an, into a diagnosis of dysautonomia, meaning that the autonomic nervous system is showing atypical regulation features, I think this vagal efficiency measure will end up being a hard metric of dysautonomia. Because dysautonomia doesn't have a diagnostic tool yet. It's right. just a clinical observations. Uh, and it's more like, I don't know what to call it, but I can see these features, I'm giving it a name. And in fact, in the medical community, these are called medically unexplained symptoms. And people listening may have some of these, which are uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, often migraines, uh, sleep disorders. And since the autonomic nervous system isn't working right, but they can't find any problems in the end organ. But what polyvagal theory, that was the theory I developed, really uh, argues is that 
long before you look at end organ damage, you should look at the neural regulation of those organs. And that's where the vagus comes in with its motor or efferent and its sensory or surveillance functions. So the vagal efficiency measure is really telling me how effectively can I regulate my autonomic state through that vagus nerve? If it's very efficient, well, you know, I'm, I'm in control. If it's not uh, efficient, so I have tone, but it doesn't seem to reliably calm me down, it's unpredictable, then the nervous system is still in a more chaotic way. And that feedback is translated into a sense of, you know, we, we interpret feedback when our systems are not regular into a sense of we're not really embodied as much or in control as much as we would like to. So I'm trying to come up with intuitive uh, measures that can be quantified very systematically that tell you something about the efficiency of your nervous system in regulating your physiological state. Are there some ways that for someone who might have low vagal tone yeah. to build that? Yeah, well, let, let's start off with, I, I would say, almost an experiential. If one were to say, how do you feel when you in, take a long time to inhale and a short time to exhale versus how do you feel when you exhale slowly and inhale for a short period of time? So I'm going to actually ask you that because as a musician, even though you were a drummer, you know that there's a visceral feeling difference. So we can go back to as a musician, how would you breathe? Would you spend more time on the inhalation or more time on the exhalation? Usually more time on the inhalation. You would. Personally. But wow. I do a lot of breathing exercises. Well, you see, that would be if you wanted a lot of physical energy, you'd do that. Mm -hmm. Because during the inhalation, you're turning off the vagal break. So if you're a sprinter or an athlete or a weightlifter, that's what you would do before you explode. So in a sense, it's taking that vagal break off. But as a drummer, maybe that would be the strategy. You might need that energy to, to hit, the, hit the skins. But as a singer, singing is slow exhalation. You can't do it any other way. Right. As a wind instrument, it's slow exhalation. So like before we put the recording on, we talked about uh, Miles Davis it's going to be slow exhalation and he's going to take you on this journey, but it's a journey of the out breath. And that's when the vagus goes, does its job. It calms us down and makes us accessible. So mm -hmm. if the music cues are within a frequency band that is, well, let's say a mother's voice, which is really what most uh, melodies are at that frequency, uh, and it's slow exhalation we're hearing will become accessible to those sounds. We can even think in terms of classical composers. So if you think about Mozart, which is really almost an archetypical iconic example of a female vocal music in the, in the opening uh, movement, it's like a mother's lullaby. It's a narrow frequency band, but extremely melodic. It's a, it's a lullaby. And so you become very comfortable. It's the voice of angels, is how Mozart was often described as. There's very little bass in the opening uh, part of the first movements of his symphonies. And then when you become very, let's say, entrained and safe with that melody, it then starts to be handed off to instruments with lower frequencies. So you now are expanding your experience without the lower frequencies, which are genetically triggers of predator sounds, we now start to encompass a greater life experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, they were smart, uh, intuitively smart, but what they were doing was priming the system to get a greater experience of music. But they understood that intonation was the portal, but the intonation had to be in a, in a had to follow certain physical rules, rules of physics of what I'm now going to bring back to the middle ear, middle ear structures that had to understand the range of sounds that recruit the feedback to contract those middle ear muscles and calm you down. Because if they violate that, they start triggering fear responses, threat responses, and that changes the individual's capacity to pull those frequencies in. And in fact, in different movements of classical music, they do exactly that, like string basses, 
it's a storm, or let's say it's impending doom. High frequency uh, violins, again, monotonic, it's a, it's a storm is gonna start coming. So the visualizations are all based upon our visceral reactions to those sounds, which has nothing to do with our real history, our own experience, but has a lot to do with our genetic history, our evolutionary history. So Stravinsky is not going to help me relax at all. Right? No, no, no. And in fact, it was rites of spring. They, they rioted because it was such a violation of the cultural norms of what people anticipate when they would go sit into a safe uh, uh, concert hall. And instead, they got dissonant sounds and violation of expectancies. And remember, violation of expectancy is a trigger to our nervous system uh, of potential danger. However, violation of expectancies in a truly safe environment triggers humor like peekaboo or even a roller coaster, which is a violation, but it's contained within safety. If you didn't feel safe, uh, those experiences would be traumatic. But feeling safe, your nervous system feels violated, then tries to make sense out of it. And we call that humor. This is so interesting. I'm just you know, thinking back to, I, I studied classical music back in college and thinking about listening to the different movements of, of yeah. symphonies and just like you're saying, how they intuitively would prepare the listener for what was next. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that just is, uh, blows my mind open. Thank you for that. No, you know, it, it, it's, it's like we're, we're this organism and all we need is the manual. <laughs> and if we have the manual, Look who we become. We become a uh, safe, connected, generative, uh, benevolent species. If we have the manual, we create the structure to enable this type of organism to be what it could be. And music is part of what we can be. It's like, oh, we have this external uh, stimuli we can put on to help us uh, take care of ourselves, to stay calm, to dissipate the difficulties of our day. So you mentioned there's a certain frequency band that yeah. allows the, the nervous system to relax. How did you discover this or, or did you <laughs> did you find it somewhere somewhere else? Well, uh, you know, uh, discovery is a mixture of theoretical in, uh, theory, intuition and uh, serendipitous findings. Um, all mammals have physical structures that define the middle ear and Without the middle ear, small bones in the middle ear being held rigid, that structure now takes in low frequency sounds. And that is advantageous if you're under threat because low frequency sounds through the evolutionary history of mammals is a threat. So it needed cues to turn that off and mammals who were social needed a frequency band to communicate to uh, the term is conspecifics. Those are the species that they were safe to come close to. So how do you convey uh, to, uh, as a primitive mammal that you're safe for another mammal to come close to you? Well, if you were in sense designing or evolving the system, you'd want the vocalizations to, to mirror the physiological state of the individual. And so if we're talking about vagal regulation of the heart as your calming system, then we have this parallel neural pathway, which is vagal regulation of vocal intonation. So we can tell in people's voices, are they safe to come close to or not? Or in small mammals, are, is, is that other mammal across the prairie safe to come close to or not? So in a sense, the vocalizations provided uh, the negotiation of proximity in psychological space. If I approach you, am I going to be welcomed and, and are you going to be accessible or are you going to kill me? Right. And uh, so that's where vocalizations came in because they became part of this system that was now mirroring our underlying physiology. So now we know that we needed certain frequencies. The issue is, and we know that those certain frequencies 
are only extractable from the acoustic environment when there's neural tone to those middle ear structures. So it changes the transfer function of what is in the outside world, the sounds in the outside world, and what we on the inside world can functionally perceive. So I call that the frequency band of perceptual advantage so that when the nerves are working, we can perceive those very accurately and very well. And what we find out is that with people who have, let's use this term, illness or trauma history where their nervous system has retuned, they have difficulty hearing what voice, what people are saying in many environments. So they have what are called auditory uh, hypersensitivities. They hear sounds as being loud, but they can't hear voice. So it's almost a paradox. Sounds are loud to me, but I can't hear your voice. So it's like, why is that happening? It doesn't make sense. So we can't amplify sound because sound is already loud to you, but you can't hear my voice. That is what those middle ear structures are doing when they work. They downregulate or dampen those background sounds and they functionally amplify human voice. And that's that frequency band of social communication. Now moving that into music, that's vocal music. So that, that's where, and that's why female vocal music or male tenors have always played that role of singing songs that made couples feel safe with each other. So in a sense, music that enabled people to be intimate with the, each other was never really low frequency sounds. And when, when I talk about that, people say, what about Barry White? And uh, with, but with Barry White, what's interesting, it's not music that you, you play in public. It's music that is in a safe environment, but that's just the introduction. He doesn't sing that low. It's just the words he uses before he sings. So it's like, uh, you know, it, it, but it's all structured within the context of understanding our nervous system. And that is, we can do different things when we are in safe environments than we can do in public environments. So I heard you say that when someone has a, a challenging experience like a surgery or a, a trauma, that their, their vagus nerve gets retuned. Is that what you said? Well, their nervous system gets retuned system. because their body is now seeing this as threat. So it's like, okay, so we, let's say you had to go in for an emergency surgery in which you didn't do any psychological preparation. You didn't have people around you to keep you calm. You didn't have a good strategy of visualizations of self-soothing and calming. And the surgery went fine, but you were in a sense, uh, your an anesthesia was forcefully induced. You were held down and then given the mask. Good intentions, people are trying to save your life and help you, but your body is in the state of threat. Now, when that is occurring, your vagus has taken the vacation. Then when they give you the anesthesia, the vagus is further subdued. Now, when you come out of anesthesia, is your nervous system robust and ready or is it injured? Are you injured, physically injured? And is that acute to your nervous system? So what I'm really saying is that for any type of medical procedure, we really have to go through a pre-training of becoming accessible for the, for, for the injury. But the injury we have to perceive not as an injury, but as something trying to help us. So there's a psychological, psychophysiological adjustment that we should be making as a pre-tuning our system before medical procedures. So the bottom line is, yeah, let's say emergency C-section for women or append appendectomy, emergency appendectomy. These are things that our body is interpreting just like a rape. It's something, it's a, a, a barbaric intrusion into our viscera without us being a party of saying, I welcome this. You basically just reiterated my my entire 2019. I had had I had five of those kinds of surgeries last oh, no. January of 2019, and I'm hearing you talk about this. I'm like, wow, that's that's exactly uh, the situation. That yeah. was a, it was a GI surgery, and that went wrong uh, oh. in every way it could go wrong. Uh, I'm I'm good now. I'm I've I've I'm regained all function. Uh, and th there's all kinds of, of funky new things that, that I didn't expect. And so uh, I'm curious to, you know, to dig more, more deeply into yeah. this. 
you, you're on this real journey of where the afferents, the sensory part of what of your subdiaphragmatic insult is actually being transmitted through the vagus, through that sensory part up to your brainstem. And you now have to create a top-down narrative of accepting, understanding, and honoring those defensive responses so that the defensiveness dissipates. Yeah. And that's actually how I would say polyvagal informed trauma therapy would work. It says, well, you know, we're human, we react. And for you, you can see the actual insults and the challenges to your life and to yourself. And you have to say, my body is doing a great job. It's signaling me, but now we have it under control and I have a different job. I have a job of rehabilitation. And so what the pains and the uncertainties can be minimized because we know where, where they're coming from. So if you are having visceral pain, it's very disorienting. But if you're told that this is the natural thing that occurs from the surgery, you say, well, I can live with that. And now let's, let's get into the rehabilitation part, which is movement. And in a sense, triggering to our body, telling where we are actively moving our body, which is ensuring our body that we're okay. That's helpful. And it's, it's just interesting to hear how it connects with the voice. I'm, I'm also a singer. And I noticed that when I sing, that's, that's one time that I really feel good. Well, the beauty of singing is that it also moves the diaphragm. Yeah. And if you had abdominal surgery, uh, your diaphragm may have frozen and uh, became rigid. I found out I had surgery and I had, of course, been a clarinetist. And so diaphragmatic breathing was part of my world, just like it would be for a singer. And suddenly I had no control over my diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So tidal volume of breathing and uh, was, so I had to, in a sense, go and rehabilitate that because the body had to say, it's okay. You can now push down on the diaphragm. It's not going to cause any injury. It seems like that part is, has come back well. Yeah. Well, your voice sounds good. So let me, in a sense, do, do my observations. Your voice sounds good. Your face looks good. Your uh, engagement behaviors look great. So <laughs> <laughs> you get, you get multiple stars. So like multiple stars from, from the, from, from the guy who knows about this stuff. Yeah. Well, so, the guy made it up. Yeah. The guy <laughs> made it up. That's the best way to know something. Make it up yourself. Tell me more about polyvagal theory. Well, let's start off with the first principle, which is that your physiological state is an intervening variable between uh, the context of the world, the stimuli out there, and your responses to the world. So based on your physiological state, the same stimulus will result in different responses. So if your body's in a safe state, certain stimuli will be entertaining or amusing. If you're a different physiological state, you'll get angry at the same cues. So it's really saying that our physiological state biases how we engage the world. It's, it's really kind of a remarkable one because in my workshops, I used to do a very simple experiential and that was inhale slowly, exhale rapidly and do this multiple times and then inhale for a short period of time and exhale slowly. And I used to put people together, one would observe, one would do the breathing and when people did the long inhalation, they would look at the other person across from them. They say to, in them, to, their, to themselves, uh, they say, did I do something wrong? Because that person is looking at me in such a critical evaluative way. And then when they would shift to the long exhalations, they would say, oh, what an attractive person. I'd like to get to know that person more. So as a singer, you may have feelings when you sing to want to meet the people in the environment in which you're singing. And they watching you, which is really watching your breath, but with vocal intonations may be attracted to you. So you start seeing this very interesting dance or dyadic interaction occurring. So polyvagal theory really says that physiological state and the breathing was just one way of shifting that vagal regulation of it. The other important principle, or let's say, is the, that through evolution, vertebrates change, their autonomic nervous system changed, and we are vertebrates. And through that evolutionary uh, sequence, we had a 
ancient vagal system, which was a shutting down or defensive system that supported death fainting under threat uh, or reduced metabolic output. And then as vertebrates evolved, they had a fight flight sympathetic nervous system that enabled them to mobilize to fight. And then finally with mammals, they have this, what I call this ventral vagus social engagement system, which links vocalizations, facial expression, listening, breath with the regulation of the heart. But with that hierarchy comes a control system model where the newer circuits are actually inhibitory of older circuits which means if you have that mammalian ventral vagal circuit on, it inhibits your defenses. It inhibits the autonomic nervous system from going into defense. And if you wanna be healthy, and this is a part of the message always, is that polyvagal theory says there's no distinction between mental and physical health. They both require the body being in a state of safety. So if you're not in a state of safety, then the neural regulation of your visceral organs violate their homeostatic principles. So rather than uh, uh, supporting health growth and restoration, they actually start destroying themselves. And that's where you get end organ diseases. But in medicine, the neural regulation of the organ is not really a major focus of their work or their education or their assessments. They're basically focusing on the end organ. So you get disease at the end organ level you don't get the anticipatory dysregulation of the system as your first warning. So polyvagal theory talks about this hierarchical systems that where newer circuits inhibit older ones, that you should keep your autonomic nervous system out of states of defense. And it, by articulating that, it provides portals of literally treatment. It says that we can get people out of these defense states, which are not merely defense for a behavioral defense, they're actually defense on the level of the organ uh, and that we can, in a sense, calm these organs down, reduce pain and improve social behavior by cues of safety to others. Kind of like going right to the root of the problem rather than dealing with it after it's already a moral. Yeah, yeah. The, the interesting part is there, there's a root of the problem in the regulation of the organs but the root of the problem seems to be quite universal, and that is bombarding our nervous system with cues of threat. So a nervous system under chronic threat is not the same as a nervous system being supported in a sea of safety. And part of, I mean, even the, the narrative of our Western culture is that if everything is so easy and supportive, we will not be motivated to do anything. And polyvagal theory, it says something a little bit different. It says, if you're safe, wow, step back and see the creativity coming out because it will come out. And, and it will so we will solve problems and we will be healthier and we'll be more interested in each other and the life will be better because our, our actual genetic uh, uh, features are that we are a connected species, which means that aspects of compassion and caring are built into us. And they're only challenged when we are under threat. When we're under threat, the benevolence becomes less important because we are now have to self-protect. Right. And so if we can get ourselves into safer feelings of safety, we become much more of a benevolent species. Do you think that the year that we've had <laughs> is retuning our nervous systems. Um, I am going to step back momentarily on that and, and give you what I call an optimistic story. And the answer is, great. Uh, yeah, it's retuning it, but we have great resilience and we all want to take a deep breath and we all want to come out and, and hug and be supported. I think it's double-edged. I think the year, both with the pandemic and the politics and the social unrest and the social in, you know, injustice issues are really important because they tell us what is important. They tell us having a voice is important. It tells us that being cared for and being respected is important. It tells us that being safe and above all, having the opportunity to engage others with whom you feel safe is critical. So the pandemic, especially to people of my generation who have to be very careful because of the risk factors, 
uh, we realize that there's only one thing of value in life and that's our relationships. So, and I think what we're learning is that success has nothing to do with wealth and accumulation. Success has everything to do with how well we are embedded or connected with others. So that's a double edge. You see, I think it's, in a sense, it's getting rid of the fallacy that there is success through accumulation and accumulation of wealth or what I used to say, or grants or publications, that's not success. You may need them, you may be able to leverage them, you may use them, but that is not the defining features of feeling that you're successful. Yeah, the, the discomfort is uncomfortable. <laughs> and yet uh, I know it's, it's personally pushed me to reduce things that are not important and eliminate yeah. and, to, and to learn new things. Uh, even this podcast is a result of uh, needing to find ways to still do my work, uh, yeah. but to do it in a completely different way. Yeah, for for me, uh, I'm really quite uh, startled by the amount of, uh, let's say, the number of hours I spent uh, on the internet doing interviews or doing things like this. Yeah. Uh, when prior to the pandemic, I'd be on an airplane once or twice a month going to someplace, but that airplane experience uh, was extremely fulfilling in many ways because you went into people's homes, into their lives, into their culture, and you became part of their family and the art, part of their culture. And when you were doing that, that's all you were doing. When I do this, as soon as I get off of this, I'm going to have to do something else. So uh, it's... I. I think part of what we were doing before the pandemic was there were clear demarcations between play, work, travel. I mean, things were clearer. And it's like something that I thought I learned when I was a graduate student, that was to work hard, but also to play hard. So in a sense, to make those definitions or defining differences between work and play, and not to always work while watching TV, but not to work while watching TV. Work, then watch TV. Work, then do something else. But it was through a discipline of intensity, both in play and work, that I really become, start to become who I am today. And I think we're kind of like, it's very hard in this uh, almost Groundhog's Day uh, metaphor of life yeah. to even keep track of what day it is. So uh, I, we're, as, a, as a society, I think we are burnt out or tired of it, but we also know what our bodies need. And we know that, that this is a time-limited, dysfunctional period of time. And we have to get prepared and we have to develop a narrative of what we are going to do when we no longer have to stay indoors. And to keep it front and center just as much as the, the immediate threats. So I was on a, a uh, uh, I was talking to my nephew who has a child who's on spectrum, autistic spectrum. And one of the features is anxiety. And I said to him, start talking about what, find out what he would really like to do. He's a young teenager now. Find out if there's something he wants to do and talk about that this is what we're going to do when this is over. You know, is it an amusement park? Is it going to this place? It's something to put out there in the future to go towards. Through all this and through all the years that you've been studying and writing and researching, uh, really, really pushing a field forward into the, into the world, what of those things, specifically with, with your vagal tone and your vagus nerve, if anything, do, do you do for yourself as, as a practice <laughs> to keep that part of you strong? Because you, you seem very, uh, very powerful, healthy, resilient, just as I'm, I'm looking at you here. So I'm yeah. wondering about this. Well, this, this has been interesting. Uh, of course, when I was, uh, I would use the term a full-time academic, uh, living within the constraints of a university, I wouldn't exercise. <laughs> Basically, I, you know, it was like, Oh, there's something get pushed on the table, pushed off the table, and it was exercise. Um, but I exercise a lot now, um, you know, because I, that's how I start my mornings, and it's quite quite an intense exercise. And what I'm do, and I actually went into training 
I had surgery a few years ago and I went to turn into training for the surgery and I went into training to be welcoming to the surgery. So what I was talking about a few minutes ago was really what I did for myself. And I also went into visualizations to see medical uh, people who are going to says, lacerate me, cut me open as doing this for me and my welcoming of it. So I had to, in a sense, reorganize my thought processes to welcome someone in that way. And I've also a sense an understanding that the body needs cues that it's okay now. And that's where exercise starts becoming important. So physical exercise. Now, the other part is, uh, I don't do yoga and I don't do traditional meditation. I do some body scanning at night, uh, which has been my kind of uh, tradition of what I've been always done. And that is to travel through my body, to feel my body, in a sense, to exercise a sense of embodiment and not numbness. Um, I am working on uh, developing devices <laughs> that will measure the, the impact of those procedures on neuroregulation. And this is where this concept of vagal efficiency becomes important. And also the notion of extracting neural, uh, neural indices from those physiological measures in more of a uh, monitoring or biofeedback, learning from my own behavior. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't, okay, so we get into the evaluative. I do wish, that wish is not a good word, I have some uh, memories of when I used to be a musician and I, I kind of miss those, okay? So I, I miss the uh, opportunity of playing a, an instrument that would have such a calming effect on me. But we are human beings and when we are an accomplished musician and try to go back to play that instrument, it can be far from, uh, uh, reassuring, let me put it that way. So uh, I'll give you the full story on this one. I was an accomplished uh, clarinetist. I was uh, trained by uh, the former solo clarinetist of uh, uh, under Toscanini with the NBC Symphony. Oh, wow. um, my, he, his, uh, his other students uh, were good students. Uh, <laughs> they were actually chairs of major symphonies. And at the time I was taking lessons with him, he was coaching Benny Goodman. So Benny Goodman, uh, and the one thing that I can always say is that one day when I was taking my lesson, uh, the phone rings, he says, keep playing. He comes back a few minutes later and he says, Benny said, you sounded great. So, <laughs> that's that's awesome. because that, the, so you can't go, that was it. Okay, but the point was that by the time I graduated from college, I was still playing and I was concert master of a wind ensemble during my uh freshman and sophomore years in college. But after that, I stopped practicing totally. And I stopped playing, except when, you know, someone come over the house, I'd play a concerto or something, I would, you know, show I could still play. And then when I was starting to get when I was in my early 30s, I decided I'd take lessons again. I was now uh, an associate professor, and I, you know, went over to the music school, I got myself a teacher, and I found out I found out what I would say the hard, true experience is that I couldn't practice anymore. It was not in me in the same way. So I could, didn't practice enough for my lessons. And I was angry and disappointed in myself. And I stopped taking lessons after a month or two. So, uh, and I kind of put it away. So it was like, uh, this is, you know, this is who I am, I guess. And uh, I, I started to feel bad that I didn't have the skill set I had before, which was the, uh, you know, if you physically, if you, if you master the physical demands of an instrument, it, the instrument becomes part of you. And True. if that is lost, the instrument is no longer you. And so I, the instrument was no longer me. And it was kind of a, uh, I would say it's like a, a divorce or something. Yeah or uh, a despair and i kind of went through that and you know i i still have the clarinet i haven't i move move it from house to house when we when we move but i haven't played it in, in i haven't played it i will tell you the last i know i haven't played it since uh the year 2000 so mm -hmm. we know it's at least 20 years uh and i probably won't but 
for me, the notion of communication shifted from playing the clarinet to what we're doing. So I view this as part of, I would say, a, a performance need of expression is through uh, socially connecting. Yeah. Have you ever considered trying a different instrument just for fun? Well, uh, it all has to do with oneself, uh, how one views oneself. And uh, I have thought about it, but it, it never uh, it never expressed itself in terms of uh, the fluidity of the, of the sound coming through me. Yeah. So it becomes part of my my heritage, my lineage, my history uh, that led me to where I am now. And it's and my concept of being musical is more of an understanding of appreciation and how it even led me into, into aspects of my science. Love that. This is so helpful. I'm really appreciating this. I'm wondering for people who want to get to know you better, I know you've got some great professional training programs uh, you have a lot of products for people with autism. Um, people, you have products for people in the general population as well. Is that right? Yeah. Well, let me talk briefly about it because the one that you would be most interested in is a music-based intervention called Safe and Sound Protocol, where we uh, it started with autistic individuals because they often had features of auditory hypersensitivities, language delays, auditory processing problems and also uh, they weren't socially engaging. And I basically developed a acoustic stimulation model where we modulated vocalizations within that frequency band of perceptual advantage and created a training program, which was five one hour sessions. And it had extreme efficacy. It was very, very effective with kids who had on spectrum, meaning that the auditory hypersensitivities for many of them disappeared. The auditory processing became normal. I mean, a variety of things. And, wow. you know, uh, so after doing this in my lab for about 20 years, um, a company called Integrated Listening Systems got interested in this and they basically licensed the technology and the technology received a patent. So it's a patented technology and uh, started to distribute it. And the interesting part is once it was being distributed, then you have creative providers or therapists who start trying it with different populations. And, you know, so they're trying it with uh, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, all these various things. But what they started to find out is that it was an accelerator for other types of therapies. So in a sense, it was functionally a state shifter and made their clients more accessible to other forms of therapy. But when it got moved into the trauma world, which is where I have actually been talking for the past 20 years or so, and yeah. where polyvagal theory starts having a lot of traction in explaining uh, the survivor's experiences, the cues of safety that were embedded in the safe and sound protocol were functionally triggers of destabilization in many people with trauma. And what that really was is that what really happened is that if you have a trauma experience, it's often related to a violation of trust or where you, one was injured by someone who they had trusted. So the nervous system gets what I call distilled cues of safety, which is really this modulation of vocalizations. It's as if it's a mother's lullaby with those modulations, but now the modulations are amplified. So it's the intonational shifts that are uh, in a sense being delivered uh, almost in a stealth manner where the nervous system can't refuse it. And the nervous system suddenly from being like this, I'm a defensive person suddenly gets like this, I'm accessible. But that accessibility means vulnerability and the person then reacts. So once we start to see that, we had to change the protocols. And now uh, the providers, in a sense, titrate very slowly and enable their clients to experience and to resolve those feelings until they basically become 
accessible to those sounds. It's really a remarkable experience for an individual who's had trauma to basically say, I'm listening to this and suddenly I can't handle it. Why? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's not that you are threatening me. It's something. And what is it? And really it's the body now starting to become accessible, but accessibility is vulnerability. And so many of the trauma therapists are using this and they're integrating it with their therapy and going slowly. The, the other part is that the intervention when it was examined for a patent, received, uh, uh, was awarded a claim of an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator because that's what it's doing. It's entering through the neuroregulation of the middle ear muscles, which affects the vagal regulation. So in a sense, in a different way, it is actually a vagal nerve stimulator. So it's, it's not transcutaneous. No, it's, 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 it's like sound. It's the sound itself in the ear. It's a thing in terms of sound bouncing off the eardrum. And if the middle ear muscles are tense, the background lower frequency bounce off. It's like a, a drum tightening the skin. If the drum is loose, the low frequency sounds go in and they mask the sounds of voice because the sounds of voice are less energetic. They have lower amplitude, less energy than the background sounds. So we naturally have a filter through our middle ear muscles mm. for most people that takes out a lot of the lower frequency background sounds. But if we're under states of threat, the adaptive reaction is to take that neural tone away and be hypersensitive to lower frequency predator sounds. So people who have experienced trauma, their bodies are tuned to detect threat. I've noticed that there are some companies in the last couple of years that have created these handheld uh, vagal nerve stimulator devices. I've seen the research on them. It seem, seems like they, they have a place, yeah. but I'm wondering, I know that we can stimulate the vagus nerve with our own voice. Yeah. Are we basically doing the same thing? Like if I hold a, a humming sound? Well, we are a society that thinks that if something is atypical, we can fix it. Uh, and we fix it through a, an exogenous uh, device, through pharmaceuticals, surgery, or a piece of equipment. Right. Um, our nervous system kind of can understand what it needs. And going through a portal, like an acoustic portal, the brainstem is actually making those decisions. Um, my son, who is a neuroscientist at the University of Florida, and his colleagues actually have a patent and a company on a closed loop vagal nerve stimulator using the ear. And then using for the feedback, they're actually measuring the vagal regulation of the heart. So they're tuning the stimulation to that. And just before I went on, I was getting there, we're in a kind of a, a feasibility test now with uh, people with PTSD. And, I, and they're getting, in a sense, some of those same types of uh, things I got with my acoustic one. And that is, they're getting some very nice positive findings, but they're also getting situations in which it may be a trigger. Mm. So the issue is using an external vagal nerve stimulator may in a sense, physiologically, we see the justification of calming, but if calming is now a trigger of injury and violation of trust, you have another problem. So it's like you need to use these tools within a therapeutic setting that has a trauma-informed and hopefully polyvagal-informed therapist. Yeah, because each person is a puzzle. Well, there's a puzzle, but the puzzle, what I'm really also trying to say is the puzzle is not a spreadsheet. It's actually organized and very predictable. Mm, okay. So if the body has been into this chronic state of defense, autonomically, you know what's going on. And you also know what the intervention is liable to do. The intervention, if it's calming, is likely to trigger more defense. So you have to, in a sense, titrate that in a way that that client feels can, can, can access it and feels uh, that it can be part of accepted and that you have a therapist who's not reading a protocol that so you need 10 minutes of this or a half hour of that, but, let's, but is actually saying, tell me how you feel with this. Yeah in a sense, using it as an exercise of embodiment or awareness of embodiment. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Dr. Porges, I could keep talking to you all day long. I know you have other interviews coming up here. Where can people go to learn more about your work? 
Okay, so go to stephenporges.com. It's Stephen Porges as one word with the S-T-E-P-H-E-N-P-O-R-G-E-S.com. And there's a, a landing uh, page uh, link for the Safe and Sound Protocol. There's a bibliography. There are some articles that are online. Uh, we are in the, uh, we're, we are creating a polyvagal institute. It's a not for profit a unit that is all about education and about creating uh, in a sense of standardized education on polyvagal theory because it's going generic and we'd like people to have um, literally a, uh, a the ability to get information and education that has a degree of, uh, that we can in a sense, certify that education. That is so exciting. I'm so glad to hear that part. Congratulations for that. That's That's a big deal. Yeah. So I will be including all this information, including your bio and all these links in our show notes. And that's going to be at donovanhealth.com slash podcast. This will also be on Facebook and YouTube. And so you'll see all those things there as well. And as always out there, if you love what you hear, you know, share this with people, uh, tell them about Dr. Porges' work, share those links with them. That's how we get information into people's hands who need it the most. So I want to give you the last word. Well, the last word is that uh, I want people to leave the, this uh, session with, with optimism that the world is not a horrible place. It's really a wonderful place. Uh, we're a wonderful species. We just need to be very aware or mindful that we react to threats. And removal of threat is not sufficient for our nervous system. We need cues of safety, which come from our interactions with other people. And music is helpful for conveying cues of safety. Thank you so much. Hang on the line here while I close this up. Everybody out there, thank you again for tuning in. I will see you next time and take care of each other. Thank you, Jim. Well, that's it for today. I appreciate you tuning in. Remember to come see us on our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search Jim Donovan Sound Health.